The following program is a special presentation of Outdoor Oklahoma. With over 70 large reservoirs, 23,000 miles of streams, and with the over 250,000 farm ponds dotting the Oklahoma landscape, Oklahoma anglers can enjoy over 1 million surface acres of fishable water. Among the estimated 800,000 resident and non-resident anglers fishing Oklahoma waters annually, the black bass remains the most sought after game fish. Whether it's the largemouth, smallmouth, or spotted bass, black bass inhabit nearly all fishable water in Oklahoma. To put it simply, black bass fishing in Oklahoma is, well, great, but it doesn't just happen. Through the efforts of the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation's Fisheries Division, along with the cooperation of concerned bass anglers, the quality of bass fishing in Oklahoma is better than ever. In the early days, the popular method of fisheries management essentially involved stocking fish. In many cases, ponds or lakes were quickly over-harvested, which required stocking more fish from other ponds or draining the pond and completely starting over. Today, the methods of fisheries management, and specifically those used for black bass populations, have become very complex. Among the many challenges facing fisheries biologists is the tremendous increase in bass fishing popularity and the resulting pressure on the black bass resource. Of the 12 million total days spent by anglers on Oklahoma waters each year, over 57% of those days are spent fishing for black bass. Additionally, black bass are the basis for an industry that generates over $300 million annually to the state's economy. To be sure, black bass are a most precious Oklahoma resource. The following program is devoted to current black bass management strategies. To find out what is being done to maximize the black bass resource, we now join fisheries biologist Gene Gilliland, along with well-known Oklahoma professional bass angler Ken Cook. Come on, fish. A little one. A little one splooshed at it. He did it. He's still it. after it. And still didn't get it. There's one. Uh oh. Yeah, he went down that quick. I don't think I'm going to have too much trouble with this fish. He's not jumping on us anyway. Oh, he went down quick. He got that top water, then he went down. Here he comes. That's clear water, boy. I right. see him a long way down there. You just get one jump out of them, that's all, he, all it needs. Come here, fish. Ken, I think that one's too big to keep. <laughs> Isn't that a bummer? Boy, I hate it when that happens. You know, I, Gene, I've, as I travel all over the country, I, I see that fishing regulations have really become popular as a means of managing fisheries. And I know when I left Oklahoma as a fisheries biologist, we didn't have anything but some minimum sizes. Uh, I understand a lot of stuff's happening now. Let's see what size this fish is. All right, we'll put him on the board. You know, this. This lake has a slot length limit on it. 13 to 16 inches have to be released. I bet he's in that slot. 14 and a half inches or so. 14 but, inches. Got to yeah, that's that's lead. an ideal fish to to as a predator and a and a, a management tool. Right. As biologists, one of the one of the three tools that we have for managing lakes is length limits. Regulations are one of the things that we use to try to control the population and the which fish are harvested and which fish are released is a very important part of the management of any of these lakes. So the fishermen are playing a big important, uh, important role in, in the management of these right. lakes. Right. It's, it's very important for fishermen to, to not only comply with the regulations, but we want them to understand why we have the different regulations on different lakes, because each lake is a little different, and we try to tailor the regulations to fit that bass population. Sounds like a deal to me. If it'll make better fishing, that's what we want. That's right. And that's a, that's just something that, something that I recall being, well, I felt like we needed years before I quit was, was a management plan designed for each individual lake because they are all different. It, even though it gets complicated at times, but as I travel all over the country, I see you know every place I go, I have to pay attention to what the state law is for this lake because I'm in a different state or sure. certainly different lakes within the states even. You, you have to pay attention to the regulations, but it's pretty simple to do and I think interested fishermen will do that. Right, and in Oklahoma, we've developed a, a system of, of essentially three different regulations for almost all the lakes across the state. And all the management that we do on all of our lakes is really part of a bigger picture. We have a black bass management plan now that allows us to, to look at each lake on its individual merits. We try to manage 
every body of water to reach its highest potential. And certain length limits are just one of the tools that we use when we're trying to manage these different lakes. We'll rejoin Ken and Gene in a moment, but let's now take a closer look at how length limits are used as a tool within the black bass management plan. This graphic shows the condition of a balanced bass population. Although most Oklahoma lakes have some type of bass length limit, some lakes have balanced bass populations, allowing anglers to harvest six bass per day of any size. Because the population has adequate recruitment, good growth rates, and a balance among the sizes of bass, a length limit is not warranted. Now let's look at a more common situation with bass populations. Due to certain environmental factors, many lakes have bass populations with low recruitment. Recruitment is different from the term reproduction in that it measures not only how successful the spawn of bass was, but also how well those bass survived to maturity. Lakes that have low or moderate survival of young bass and therefore low or moderate recruitment but still have good growth rates are prime candidates for a minimum length limit. Basically, low recruitment lakes have no surplus of small bass, so a minimum length limit of, say, 14 inches affords them protection from harvest. Young bass are therefore allowed to grow to a quality size before they might be removed by anglers. A different situation on some Oklahoma lakes occurs when recruitment is high. A byproduct of high bass recruitment is a population dominated by small bass. With overcrowding of small bass, the competition for adequate forage often results in poor growth and body condition with few large bass produced. By imposing a slot length limit on these high recruitment lakes of 13 to 16 inches, anglers can reduce the density of the overabundant small bass by harvesting fish under 13 inches. Those fish remaining in the lake will have less competition for food and thus improved growth rates. Another way length limits are used in the black bass management plan is to provide trophy bass fishing opportunities. We'll take a closer look at the special trophy bass length limits a little later. Now let's rejoin Ken and Gene. One of the things I've noticed over, over years is that if you, before you can have a plan, you've got to, got to know what the problems are. If, if you have a black bass management plan, that means you must have some system for analyzing the, the fisheries is that probably the main tool you still use is electrofishing. Right, electrofishing is, is the primary tool that we use to survey our bass populations. We do a standardized survey. All of our biologists use the same equipment mm -hmm. across the state. They do things the same way. They, they take their samples the same time of the year in the springtime uh, every well, year. And they, they try to look at uh, doing things in a, a standardized format so that all of our data is comparable from one lake to the other. Well, every lake is a little bit different. I, I know uh, chemically, which, which means that electrofishing used to be not as efficient in one lake as it was another because of it was so limited. But new, with the new equipment, I bet you can, you can stabilize that out, and that makes that standardization a lot simpler. Right, and the, the equipment that we've got now is, is real easy to use. It's real easy to work with, and it does allow us a lot of flexibility and a lot of control to be able to adjust it for the different types of conditions that we have across Oklahoma. And what we really look at are not so much a one-time sample, but what we get from one year to the next. It's really important to Trends. do the samples yeah, for two or three years in a row, right, and look at that trend information because that's, that's what tell us, tells us if the population's going up or down or sideways. And then from that, we've got, uh, we've got other tools then that we're gonna apply to that lake once we've determined what's going on out there. Well, once you have, if you have creel information, that is how, what the fishing is like on a given year, and you know how many bass were there to produce that quality fishing. If you change, the, if the creel survey change, or changes, indicates that fishing is different, you can relate that to different fish populations that you've found out from the, from the, the electro fishing. So exactly. it doesn't, it isn't necessarily that you know how many bass are in there, but you know it's better than it was when fishing was, was was good or when it was bad or when it was two years ago, you know, the trend, it changes. Right. Well, hey. well, that didn't take very long. There we go. <laughs> That's a pretty nice fish there. Look at at least a lot of places it would be a real nice fish. Hey, yeah, there have been plenty of times in tournaments I'd have taken, taken a live well full of these. Yeah, just one of those sometimes makes all the difference in the world mm -hmm. if it's a keeper. But uh, that's probably not a keeper of this lake. I doubt it, Nick. Hey, it looks like this fish has been caught and released here. Mm -hmm. That's a good sign. That's that it's working. And this well, he's been caught and released on both sides. He sure has. Like. <laughs> See, somebody, somebody's abiding by the slot limit there. Well, none of these regulations will work unless the anglers are complying. Fourteen and a half. 
Well, that's a good quality predator to go back and produce a better fishery. Yep, and this lake, we gotta turn them loose. Well, you know, most of the lakes, when I left fisheries was, uh, we were going to 14 inch minimums as a, as a pretty well a statewide regulations, but I know, knowing all along that that wasn't gonna work for every, for every lake. Why is there a slot limit on this lake? Well, our survey work that we've done on all of our lakes, we look at a couple of things. One of them is what we call recruitment, which is the survival of the small fish to their first birthday. So it's not just reproduction. It's not just reproduction. Right. The, the bass spawn usually is, is plentiful enough to, to populate the lake, but those little guys have got to survive. And that's what we call recruitment. And then we also look at growth rates. You've got to have plenty of groceries out there to feed them so that those fish grow up. So it's, like a, it's kind of like a pasture. If you have too many animals in there, then they won't grow. And if you don't have growth, then they won't reach a minimum size. That's right. right. And it's minimum length limit lakes, we look for, usually uh, sometimes they'll have lower density bass populations, lower recruitment. But which they have is, to have high growth rates. But That's we want to have really high growth really rates, because if they, if they don't ever get to 14 inches, then you don't have any keeper fish out there and you wind up with essentially a stunted bass population. A wasted fishery, basically. And that's what we had in some of our lakes where we started out with 14 inch minimums. We found that the reproduction and the recruitment was too high and you wind up with a stunning population. So in, that's that's when we go to the slot length limit, situations right. like that. And that's what happened in our book where we're fishing today, right? And initially there was a 14 inch minimum. Exactly. Which stockpiled and now you have a, a slot limit, which, which now we need anglers to take away some of these smaller fish, some under the slot fish. Everything we've caught this morning so far has been in the slot, but I bet before the day's out we'll catch some small ones because there are lots of them there's, according to your survey. There's zillions of them in here. <laughs> Ooh, it's a big it's spotted a spotty bass. bass. This lake must be slam full of those little guys. Mm -hmm. A keeper. Ah, uh, yes, it is a keeper. Strange deal where you talk about keeping small ones and turning loose the middle sized ones. But this to keep this fish would really be doing this fishery a service. Exactly right. And since I like to eat bass, and I sell them, really I seldom get to keep bass in my in my tournament travels. We always turn them loose in tournaments. Uh, you know, I seldom get to keep fish. So I like to come to a lake like this where actually I can do the, the fishery some benefit, take a few of these fish home for my family to eat, and I like to eat bass. So I'm gonna put this one in my live well. Go right ahead. That's what we encourage folks to do. These lakes that have slot length limits on them, you've got you've to thin those small bass out to try to get the balance back between the predators and all that prey that's mm -hmm. out there. And keeping those small bass is one way of doing that. Well, I don't, I don't think we'd necessarily encourage everybody to keep all the fish they catch over the slot. Oh, no. But keep, a, keep your limit under the slot if you, if you can and, and if you can use the fish. Right, and that's, that's where we, in these lakes that we have this high recruitment like this, we have an overabundance of those real small fish. Mm -hmm. And that's the ones that really need to be thinned out for that length limit to work the way it's supposed to. We need to get more harvest of those little Without bass. Without that harvest, it's, it's just like a 16-inch minimum size, which really only compounds the problem when you have too much recruitment. Exactly. We, we feel that, that catch and release has really been oversold. It's very appropriate in some situations, but in a case like this, we prefer to go with a philosophy called selective harvest, where you, you allow people to keep some of the fish that there's a surplus of. And here it's those small fish. Right. And in very few places there's actually a surplus of two large fish. Right. And even though the slot limit allows you to keep a you know, larger fish over the, over the slot, the 16 inches here, but we, not necessarily that you should catch every one you, keep every one you catch over the slot. Right. The selective harvest idea, you think of the fish population as a pyramid. The top of the pyramid, the, where those big fish are, is pretty small. And so those are kind of a rare resource. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good to release those fish because that gives somebody else a chance to have the opportunity to, to catch a really trophy fish. But if a person wants to have a trophy fish, mm -hmm. that gives them an opportunity to, to sure. do that. And that's, that's why our regulations, even with a slot length limit, we have an upper and a lower end because there are people that like to keep fish and that like to eat fish. And, and we have to tailor our regulations to work with all of our anglers, not just a select few. There he is too. What, did you call that shot or what? <laughs> you get to do that after 14 years of doing this. Yeah, there's one. He's, not a, he's not a big one. There's one I'll bet you that's legal. That's a keeper. Spotted bass. You know, there's, they say there's 82 million of them like at this size in this lake. And 
So far we hadn't found them, but we may be about to figure it out. They're out in a little bit deeper water. Right. I'm gonna take him home and feed my family with him. Yeah, he's definitely under the slot. We'll put him in there. He'll be lunch. Especially the slot limit regulations won't work unless uh, some people, some fishermen catch and keep harvest some of those under the slot fish. That's right. And I'm more than willing to do my share because I don't get to eat deer enough bass. You know, in a lot of cases, these lakes, we really do have a, a surplus of those small spotted bass. That's, they're kind of the culprit. They're almost like a weed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't grow very fast. They're, they're fairly small and they're, they're prolific. Pro oh, man. They're a definition of the word. <laughs> there's, there's some of our lakes that those spotted bass make up 40% of the bass population. And, and they're probably a very small percentage of the, of the big ones. Right, very few of them ever get, ever get over 14 inches. They just grow so slowly. But the good thing about spotted bass, they do bite most of the time. They are, they are fairly easy to, to get to bite. They're not easy to catch all the time when they do bite. Among various measurements, biologists conducting electrofishing surveys look at the catch rate of bass per hour and the number of fish over 14 inches. These two factors help biologists evaluate the lake's recruitment, growth rate, and overall population structure. Once the population is defined, the biologists can then make accurate management recommendations, such as imposing certain length limits. Although the bass are stunned by the electrical current, then netted, weighed, and measured, all the fish sampled by electrofishing are returned to the water with no permanent harm. Contrary to some myths, electrofishing does not have any detrimental effect upon the water itself or the fishing success of those areas that are sampled, nor does electrofishing have any adverse effect upon the spawning success of bass. Since its inception in 1977, electrofishing has been improved and standardized and is now by far the safest, most accurate, and cost-effective means for sampling Oklahoma bass populations. Let's now see how Ken and Gene are doing. We've come out here and found a piece of offshore structure, a hump that runs out there offshore. I think this looks like a good place to catch a big bass. There's a lot of bass fishermen that I, that I talk to in seminars around the country that want to know how they can catch a big bass. I, once you get to a certain stage of fishing, you want to catch a big fish. What's the uh, black bass management plan have in store for trophy bass fishing? The trophy bass aspect of our management plan is a whole section on, all to its own. We feel that the trophy fishing has gotten popular in a lot of place, places around the state and we're trying to emphasize that on a select few number of lakes. Well, I know the state record in Oklahoma stayed 11 pounds 15 ounces for like 40 years and was changed in, I think it was 82 on, when uh, James Porter caught a 12 pound something, broke that state record in 82, and that was a result of a Florida bass docking that, that happened at Lake Latonka in like 1970, 71. Is the Florida bass played a big role in that trophy management plan? Oh, it's, it's kind of the cornerstone, really, in our, in our Florida bass, in our trophy management. The Florida bass are really important in terms of providing the genetic component. Uh, trophy management is, is not just Florida bass, though. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it involves stocking Florida bass, but it also involves some very special regulations to protect those fish until they get big enough to be called trophies. Obviously, uh, you've, to get a trophy bass, it's going to take some years on that fish to get him to grow up to become a trophy. But it also takes the right water quality, the right habitat, fertility. A lot of things have to be uh, appropriate in order to have a good successful trophy fishery and I guess that's why there's not very many of them. Right, that's why we can't make every lake into a trophy bass lake. There's a, just a handful that we've identified around the state that have the potential of producing any kind of numbers of trophy fish. Uh, well, why don't we stock Florida bass all over? That's a question I get asked because because it has been so successful in some areas right. all the fishermen want to have you know a 12 pounder in their backyard but sure. there's got to be some latitude well, you get too far north, the genetics don't that, work. That's the biggest thing, the climate in Oklahoma. We're right on the border of where Florida bass have any potential of doing us any good for trophy production. Uh, and in fact, we've found that you can draw a diagonal line across the state from northeast to southwest, say from mm -hmm. Tulsa, Oklahoma City, to Lawton. South of that line, the Florida bass seem to survive and do fairly well. North of that line, the climate just seems to catch up with them, and the survival is so poor that we don't get any kind of trophy production out of those fish. Yeah, that's the 
ones I know about are in that zone, like Lake Latonka was early when Lake Fuqua is a city managed lake in, right. at Duncan. And of course, and, people are familiar with uh, some of the, the trophy bass lakes around the state, Sardis and McGee Creek, and in the, uh, in the southeastern part of the state, where we probably have the best potential for that. The climate's milder, and right. which suits the genetics of the Florida stream. But it's, it's also, like you said, it's related to habitat, the forage in the lake. We've got to have good growth rates because you don't produce trophy bass by uh, keeping them underfed. Right. So we've got to have a combination of things. And there are some lakes that we've got these special regulations that I mentioned. Uh, we've got two different types of trophy regulations. One of them is a, a big slot length limit, just like mm -hmm. we've got a 13 to 16 slot on this lake. And that would be for lakes that have a lot of recruitment. Right. Like this one. Right. If you've got high recruitment but still want to produce that trophy lake, we just bump that slot limit up and we go 16 to 22 inches. So you keep your fishes under 16 inches or a trophy right. over 22 inches. And the same situation applies in those lakes as, as in these other slot limits like here at Arbuckle. We encourage people to keep the fish below the slot length limit. So that the ones that are left can grow. Grow faster, right. exactly. Because we want to try to maximize that growth rate, take advantage of that genetic component that's in that lake, and get those fish as big as possible in as few years as possible. Sure. The other other lakes that we have where recruitment is not high, maybe the habitat's a little bit more limited, uh, we don't have as high a density population, but we get really good growth rates, then we go with a 22 inch minimum. It's the minimum size. Yeah. They can't keep anything under 22 inches, which for many years of a fish's life, it's going to be catch and release situation. And, and that's one of the things we mentioned earlier where catch and release really plays a big part yeah. in those lakes. Because, because it is a limited population already. Right. Every fish has the potential to be big. And if you want to produce 10 pounders, you've got to turn the 5 pounders loose. Absolutely. And if you want to catch 12 pounders, you've got to turn the 10 pounders loose. That's, That's right. really hard. As Gene mentioned, there are some special length limits placed on certain lakes to enhance the potential of catching trophy bass. These are either high minimum length limits or high slot length limits. Remember this graphic shown earlier? Even though a lake has been stocked with Florida strain bass, it may still have low to moderate recruitment. In this case, a minimum length limit of 22 inches may be imposed simply to afford protection to the Florida bass to attain their genetic potential. On the other hand, Florida bass stocked into a lake may have the genetic potential for growing to trophy size, but high recruitment has resulted in an overabundance of small fish in poor condition. In this case, a high slot length limit of 16 to 22 inches is set. As with the other slot limit, anglers are encouraged to harvest bass shorter than 16 inches from these lakes. By thinning out the overabundant small fish, the individuals left have more to eat and can thus fulfill their Florida genetic potential. Now let's check back with Gene and Ken. Here he comes. Well, he was deep. These fish are deeper than, yeah. than I think we thought. I bet you this is a slot fish. Come here, little guy. You know, a lot of one thing that's real important for these catch and release situations is is making sure that that you get the fish back in the water as soon as possible, and uh, handle them by the lower jaw, and try not to handle them any more than you have to, and then don't just fling them back in the lake. Just ease them back and let them go. You know, yeah, it is real important because if you don't turn those fish loose so that they can live, the, the regulations won't work. That's right. You know, and I guess you run into a situation in a lot of in tournaments where you've got to keep those fish alive for the weigh-in. Right. Yeah, we uh, we penalize if we bring in a dead fish, so it's it's real important to us not only financially but for the fishery that we're we're involved with. It's really important to handle those fish properly because it doesn't make any difference how good a tournament officials do if you don't bring live fish to them, they cannot. They can't turn them loose, so it's it's very important not only to keep them alive now, but to ensure that they'll survive in the future. Right. We have a thing that we call the tournament weigh-in kit. That yeah, we I've heard about that. We loan that out to bass clubs all over the state. It's free of charge. We've got six or seven of them around the state now that uh, local tackle companies help pay for uh, building these kits, and they're loaned out to any bass club that wants to borrow it. And it's essentially like you would use, uh, you're probably familiar with what BASS uses. Yeah. It's the same kind of setup, just a much smaller scale that a small local club tournament can use and do a lot better job of keeping those fish in good condition. It helps them get over that stress that you talked about. Oh, there's one right there. And I 
Well, there's another. Picture isn't very big. Yeah, what do you call that? It was a group of them. Wait a minute, he's. It was a group of them there, but. Oh, <laughs> unfortunately, when there's a group, the most times they're small. <laughs> yeah. But these are keepers. You know, you, you can catch two kind of keepers here. These yeah. are the these are the eating kind of keepers. These are the these are the small end keepers. Well, let's keep them. I right. don't think we've got too many for dinner yet, do you? No, no. It, it takes several of these to make yeah, a dinner. That's true, but those are surplus fish. That's, that's the good right. thing about that. That's why we've got some, when we've got that many, we want to try to get get them thinned out. There he is, on. All right. Well, that's still that's not the keeper we wanted. You know, I know that, that Florida bass, or that, that new state record that was caught in 82 that broke that 41-year, 11-pound, 15-ounce record, that was a Florida bass, as I understand it. How do you tell the difference? I know anglers are continuously asking me how to tell the difference, and that technology was just being developed right. 12 years ago. Well, that's, that's one thing we hear all the time. People want to know how to tell them apart, and you can't tell them apart by looking at them. Yeah, I, I knew that. We've, uh, we've looked at thousands of bass, and uh, we have to wind up doing a a chemical test on a liver sample. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You take their liver? Okay, what do you do with the liver? Taste of it? <laughs> well, not exactly. <laughs> what we wind up having to do is a process called electrophoresis. Where it's we not take a 25 a, cent word. Well, no, no, that's that's one of our official scientific terms where we, we take that liver sample and it's a biochemical test that looks at the enzymes that you have in uh, liver tissue. And that's the only positive way of telling a Florida bass from a native bass or the cross between the two. And we can tell, oh, I see. We can tell whether it's a first generation cross or whether it's some other generation and try to determine how much reproduction we're getting after we've stocked the Floridas. And uh, that also gives us an idea of, of whether our trophy bass stocking is, uh, is doing us any good or not. What's, what's the deal with smallmouth? Are we stocking more smallmouth now? Smallmouth is one of the one of the things that stocking, we think, does have some potential. Uh, you know, they have a little different habitat requirements. And we've got a lot of lakes around the state now that are a little older. They don't have any vegetation. There's no flooded timber left. They've got clear water like this. They've got rocks. They've got good habitat. And they've got plenty of groceries. And that's everything a smallmouth could ask so for. So they fill a different niche, really, that you think that, exactly. I think that smallmouth can live there and not actually rip replace, say, spotted bass or largemouth, but actually an additional fish. It's kind of an enhancement, right. And uh, we have a lot of places that we think we can put them. We've been using a, a strain of smallmouth that originated in reservoirs in Tennessee. And we think that these fish have a more of a genetic potential to adapt to our lake environments than our native stream mm -hmm. smallmouth. I know we have a lot of native, native smallmouth streams in eastern Oklahoma, and I like to go fish the Glover and, and Mountain Fork and Illinois River and those kind of places where there's those little smallmouth are, are native, but they are small, but surely there's something we can do to make those better. Well, we've, we've tried to build that into our black bass management plan is doing a lot more survey work on the streams, find out what's out there, because that's, that's the first part of the whole package is, is doing the work to figure out what you got to start with. And then uh, working with landowners and with other public authorities on, on access to those streams so that people, mm -hmm. more people can enjoy them because a lot of it's on private land. Well, as I travel around fishing around the country, I, I like to fish for smallmouth. Anybody that's ever caught a smallmouth likes them, and I think that program is going to be real popular. You bet. As Gene and Ken have mentioned, the department's black bass management plan includes another tool to enhance bass populations, which involves hatchery stockings of Florida strain largemouth bass and also lake strain smallmouth bass. Let's now hear from Gordon Shomer, manager of the Durant State Fish Hatchery. But what the biologists try to do is, is once they request the Florida bass and we stock them in at about three inches in length over a couple years, as those bass get big enough to, to spawn themselves, then they start producing other Florida bass or they'll even cross with some of the natives so that we're impacting the genetics of those lakes. And after several years of doing that, then the population of either pure Floridas or a hybrid cross between the two comes up. And that's, a, that's why we're starting to see quite a few state records the last, last few years in particular. Most of the, most of the time, uh, bass spawning is real typical from year to year. Uh, once we have a brood stock, we'll go through them, sort them out, get an idea of how many we have and, and, and what, what ages they are and what sex they are and try to pair them up in the ponds. So we go ahead, get our ponds ready, fill them up with water. Uh, we'll treat them so that way the water stays as clear and, and as long as possible. We'll go ahead and put the bass in when our water temperature gets about 
55 to 60 degrees because they start to spawn at around, right around 60 degrees and then you just basically just let them do everything naturally from that point on. The male and the female will, will pair up, the male will go out in the pond, he'll find a suitable site that he wants to make a nest and he'll use his tail and kind of fan out a spot in the bottom of the pond. Uh, once he's got his spot picked out, he gets the female to come to the nest, she lays the eggs, he'll fertilize them, and then he'll guard those eggs until they hatch. And that usually takes about a week for the hatch, depending on how warm the water has gotten from the point when they lay them to the point they hatch. Once they've hatched, he'll stay right with that school of fry until they're big enough where they can swim and defend themselves. And usually that's about two weeks. When they get about three-fourths of an inch long, that school will break up and they'll start swimming the banks on their own. And the same happens with all the rest of the bass in the pond. They'll have small schools of fry. When they get big enough, they'll break up, and then you'll have larger schools that you, you can find just scattered throughout the pond. Uh, what our main goal is, is once they get, to, once they're in the school and before they get to the size, if they break up and start swimming the banks, we try to go out and sain those schools of fry up. Now they have to be a little bit bigger. They can't be real small, at least about a three-fourths of an inch. So we forget to have just a real small time frame from when we have to when find the school and before they break up to get them out. And once we, we've sained up as many as we can possibly get, we stock those out into other ponds so they can grow to a little bit larger size, usually either an inch and a half or three inches. Those are the two sizes we try to go with, stock into public waters. Okay, the smallmouth bass are a little bit different on how they spawn. They, they usually like to spawn on something like a gravel bed or a grassy mat or something in the pond. So we try to put out some gravel spawning sites in the ponds for them and we do basically the same thing. We get our brood stock, we go through them, kind of inventory them, get an idea on our numbers and the, the sex ratio and try to pair them up in each pond. And once you've stocked them out into the ponds, they go to the nesting sites and, and for the most part they try to they try to use them, although sometimes they like to to lay make their own nesting spot in the in the pond bottom right beside that. Now, once the eggs are laid, the male and the, or the female will get together and she'll lay the eggs, the male will fertilize them. And once the eggs have been laid, the male will stay right there and protect them until they've hatched. Once they hatch and the fries start to form a school and, and stuff like that, they, he tries to stay right with them until they're about three-fourths of an inch or half an inch, and they start running the banks. And then we try to do the same thing. We try to, try to go out and sane those fries and restock them back into the other pond so they can get between an inch and a half and three inches of growth on them. Okay, what we're doing is going through our brood stock to check and make sure that everything we have is a pure Florida. And these fish have all been pit tagged with the little magnetic marker that we inject into the body cavity and it gives us a rating on this machine. We try to do this every spring so when we put our bass out to spawn we to make sure we don't have any uh, native bass or integrates that get mixed in with our Floridas. Okay, that one had a rating on it, so we could tell that one was a pure Florida. Most of our bird stock are roughly about that size, anywhere from a half a pound to about three pounds. This is a typical pit tag which we inject into our Florida bass bird stock so we can keep a good idea what our inventory is for the numbers of fish we have, the age of the fish, and the sex of the fish. And what it is is just a, a little little glass encased magnetic code that's on this little strip in there and the scanner reads that code and gives us a, a printout eight to ten digit number combination so each fish is has its own unique number and code and these fish these are uh, all the fish that we we put these into are fish that are at least eight inches long and they go through the process of being certified so they are a pure Florida before we even inject these into them. So they have to go through that process first. And once they, once they are certified, then we take this needle right here, and we take the pit tag, stick it into the end of the needle, and we have the fish in our tanks, and we'll go ahead and anesthetize them. And once they're anesthetized, they're laid out flat, and we inject the, this right into the body cavity. And once, the, once it's injected in, we kind of pull it back out and once it's inside the body cavity it should stay there permanently and the fish is left in the tank for a day or two to kind of recover from this process and once they're getting healthy we we'll go ahead and put them out to our ponds to spawn and if, if they're a lot of our fish since we're doing when they're kind of small about eight inches long 
Uh, a lot of times the process is done late in the fall after we've already raised a crop of, of fish off of our pure Floridas and we never try to keep back so many that we go ahead and try to use as future breeders and that's what we go ahead and try to pit tag and certify at that time. That's usually late in the fall or early winter. Although the emphasis has been placed upon raising Florida strain largemouth bass and lake strain smallmouth bass, the hatchery system still raises some native strain largemouth for the farm pond stocking program and a few new or renovated lakes in the northern part of the state. Let's now see how Gene and Ken are doing. Some of the other new stuff that we're really getting into uh, involve the third tool that I mentioned earlier that we have as managers, and that's working with the habitat. You know, the, well, somebody else generally controls water levels and things like that, the Corps of Engineers, or the Grand River Authority, Bureau of Reclamation, somebody. So a lot of times uh, there's things that go on that don't fit into our management scheme the way we want to. But we're trying now to look at some potential uh, habitat enhancements. And, and by that, I don't mean sinking brush piles. You know, most people think of putting That's out, the first thing we think of. Yeah, yeah, as a brush pile as being habitat. But those are really fish attractors. What we're trying to do is improve the habitat for little fish, because you've got to have little ones first. And we're, we're getting into aquatic vegetation introductions. Uh, it'll be native vegetation, native vegetation right. that we can control and manage and hopefully provide additional quality habitat in that nursery area that you need for the little guys to survive the summer when uh, normally they'd be out there in, in open water being eaten by other predators. And the Corps of Engineers and some other groups are, are really working with us now and they've got people that are trained as plant experts and we're doing some cooperative projects to try to get things on board with them. And we're also getting a lot more cooperation with, with the people that control these lakes in looking at water level management. Well, that's, that's certainly a key. It affects fishing. It's got to affect the fishery because some years high water makes a good year class, a lot of little bass, and some years none. And that's a very important issue. And of course, Mother Nature has a lot to do with, with what kind of water we get from one year to the next. But if the controlling agencies can hold that water at the right times of the year and flood back into some of that grass and brush and vegetation on the shoreline, it can really help produce a lot more, uh, a lot higher recruitment. We'll there's some little recruiting We'll get right some over there. fish that, uh, that can survive the summer. Some little bass recruiting some shad for breakfast. Over there? Well, <laughs> let's, let's see if we can't find some of these little guys. We, we've got to get you a, a live well full of these small ones to take home to eat. I'm for that. There he is. Eat that little worm again. It's hard to beat a little worm when you're trying to catch just numbers fish. Numbers fish. <laughs> there he is. It was pretty deep. Ah, come here, you. I feel dinner coming on here. Mm -hmm. We'll put him in the boat and let everybody play with him. Yeah, that's the way we do it in the tournaments. You know, and that's another thing. If you, the quicker you land a fish, the more likely he is to be releasable. You I mean, bet. You don't want to play a fish a real long time. He's not, it decreases the odds for survival, but this one's going to get fried. A lot so. less stress. <laughs> we're not going to worry about it too much on that one. I'm going to get dinner yet. Good deal. As Gene mentioned, the third tool used in the black bass management plan involves habitat enhancement through planting native vegetation. Projects such as this on Lake Arcadia, where fisheries personnel planted multiple varieties of native aquatic vegetation, will be evaluated in coming years. Biologists hope to determine which varieties can be cheaply and effectively transplanted to lakes which are lacking in aquatic vegetation. In addition to providing critical nursery areas for young bass, the vegetation may help stabilize shoreline areas against wind or wave erosion and may enhance overall water clarity. Now back to Ken and Gene. Well, Gene, I tell you, I travel all over the country and I talk to thousands of fast fishermen every year about fishing and about fisheries, both, because of my background as a fisheries manager. And I'm, I'm really excited about this new management plan. I think that Oklahoma may be on the right track to, to the future of bass fishing in Oklahoma may look a lot brighter. We hope so. It gives us some goals, some long-term objectives, and, and really puts things down in black and white that that we can plan with, and it lets the fishermen know what we're doing with their license dollar, too, as far as trying to, to manage all the lakes and where we're going with bass fishing. Let's go right here on this point with bass fishing. To become a partner in Oklahoma black bass management, bass anglers are encouraged to adopt the following. Practice selective harvest, which includes keeping small bass below the slot length limit. 
Also, voice your support for sport fishing interests, which at times must compete with other non-fishing water usage interests. And lastly, pass on the great sport of bass fishing. One group of Oklahoma bass anglers, the Guthrie Bass Club, is a prime example of how bass tournament organizations can pass on their knowledge and love of fishing to future generations. After being trained through the Department of Wildlife's Aquatic Resources Education Program, club members conduct an annual fishing clinic for every fifth grade student in the community. Although it requires time off from busy work schedules, club members say the benefit is well worth it. By us putting on this seminar, you have to stop and realize this involves every kid in the sixth grade class, black, white, male, female, it makes no difference. Fishing is something that everybody can take part in, young and old. And uh, that's, I think that's why this is so special to us. Everybody gets to take part in it. And I'd just like to make a challenge to other bass club uh, members and bass clubs to uh, check into this. You won't believe how much fun it is. It's a ball, very rewarding. We fish, we fish quite a few tournaments every year, but this is probably the most rewarding thing we do all year long. Catch it. I put the um the put the new the line on it and it grabbed it and I yanked it and I lifted it up. And it, and it came out of the water. She caught it. Did it fight hard? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are you gonna keep it to eat it or what? No, nah. I have to throw it back. Like the said. It's a ball. Look. What kind is it? A cross crappie. Have you ever caught a fish before? No. no. That's I've never your first fish? fish? Yes. In our lifetime? Are you going to fish more now? Yeah. yeah. I think that's pretty fun. Now. Huh? Yes. There. According to national surveys, most avid anglers of today were introduced to fishing before the age of 12. These statistics also show that most anglers were introduced to fishing by a parent. In today's society of high divorce rates, single parent households, urbanization, and less time for recreation, many kids are never getting exposed to fishing. In addition to learning the basics of fishing and the thrill of catching their first fish, many of the aquatic education youth fishing clinics pass on another important message to kids, to get hooked on fishing, not drugs. For more information on how your bass club can sponsor youth fishing clinics in your community, please contact the Wildlife Department's Aquatic Resources Education Program at area code 405-521-4603. The Department of Wildlife needs your help to pass on the natural high of fishing to the next generation of Oklahoma anglers.